this morning, amen? amen? We have some incredible, incredible musicians in our church, and this is a joy to, to hear them use their gifts and abilities to lead us in worshiping the Lord. So thank you uh, to all of our choir, orchestra, Brother Terry, for leading us in song this morning. Well, uh, Pastor Bill and Miss Beverly are in Tennessee right now getting some rest, and I know he's with us, he's thinking about us, and he's praying for us, and he's invited me to preach the gospel this morning. And it is just a tremendous privilege and honor to be here this morning in this capacity. Uh, no greater name than Jesus. To be able to stand before you and proclaim his name, it's just a tremendous, tremendous honor this morning. Um, as Pastor Bill asked me to preach this morning, I immediately was drawn to one of my favorite passages of Scripture from the Old Testament. A passage that deals with five promises of God. And I started thinking about it and praying over what I was going to preach, what scripture I was going to use to preach from. And I kept coming back to Zephaniah 3, 17. If you think about a promise, a promise is a powerful, powerful tool. Both when it's been kept, but also when it hasn't been kept. Victoria, my wife and I, we have three young children, and we feel it is so important the promise is so important that we are so careful to even use that word with our girls. Because they know that if Daddy promises something, he's going to do everything within his power to make it happen. So because of that, because of that, we're careful to, to, to be... We're careful what we promise for. We don't want to make a promise and have to break it. Because a broken promise carries just as much power, oftentimes more power, than a kept promise. So today, the message I've got for us today is promises, promises, promises. And we're going to look at five specific promises found in Zephaniah. So if you have your Bible, I want to invite you to turn to Zephaniah chapter 3. We're going to read starting in verse 14, and we're going to read through verse 20. The text is going to be on the screens. Uh, there's an index in the front of the Bible if you need some help finding it. Or you can go to Matthew and go to your left four books. You'll be able to find Zephaniah. Uh, so if you would, stand with me as we read the word together. And remain standing afterward while I pray and you can have a seat. Zephaniah 3, verses 14 through 20. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. In that day shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Let not your hands be weak. The Lord your God in your midst. The mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. I will gather those who sorrow over the appointed assembly. Who are among you? To whom is reproach is a burden. Behold, at that time I will deal with all who afflict you. I will save the lame and gather those who were driven out. I will appoint them for praise and fame in every land where they were put to shame. At that time, I'll bring you back. Even at that time, I gather you. For I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I return your captives before your eyes, says the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the privilege you've given us to openly worship you. Father, I thank you for the promise of your word. God, I pray that you would open our hearts and open our minds to what your word has for us this morning. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. Go ahead and have a seat, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. So this text contains tremendous promises, tremendous imagery, but before we deal specifically with our text, we picked up in the third chapter of Zephaniah, it's important to understand the context in which it was written. In the very first verse of Zephaniah, 1-1, one, one, it addresses Zephaniah as, being, as prophesying the days of Josiah. Now, if you recall, Josiah was a king of Judah at the age of 8. I was trying to learn how to hit a fastball when I was 8. Josiah was the king of Judah at the age of 8. At this point in time in Israel's history, the northern kingdom 
had already been conquered, taken away. The southern kingdom remained. The southern king, kingdom had yet to be taken. The capstone event in Josiah's reign was discovery of the book of the law, which led to a wholesale reform of Judah's worship. They discovered the book of the law, and God's word transformed how they worshiped. Josiah led them in reforming their worship, and he also led them through political reform. So we see the northern kingdom of Israel has already been taken. The southern kingdom hasn't been conquered yet. And Zephaniah brings a prophecy. If we look at the, the context of Zephaniah leading up to this great promise, in chapter 1 we see the pronouncement of judgment. One of the most incredible, incredible passages of Scripture dealing with God's judgment. It says in verse one, chapter 1, verse 12, I will punish the men who are settled in complacency. The whole land shall be devoured. Just an incredible, incredible pronouncement of God's judgment. Opening verses in chapter 2, Zephaniah calls the people to repentance. He calls the people to repentance. He says, gather yourselves before the decree is issued. Seek the Lord. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. The third chapter goes into an indictment and judgment against not only Jerusalem, but the nations. He says in, in, in chapter 3, verse 1, he refers to the people as rebellious and polluted, who haven't obeyed, they haven't received correction, haven't trusted, haven't drawn near to God. He says, I have cut off the nations, their fortresses are devastated, their cities are destroyed. So that's the context. Those are the chapters that lead up to today's passage. In Zephaniah 3, verse 12, God gives a promise of remnant. He says, I will leave in you, in your midst, the meek and a humble people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. So we see this pronouncement, this incredible pronouncement of judgment, a call to repentance, a further pronouncement of judgment, not just against Jerusalem, but all nations, but then a promise of a remnant. And then we get to today's specific text. And we're going to look specifically at Zephaniah 3.17. Let me read it again for you. The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. We see in this verse a tremendous, tremendous picture of God's love. In the verses leading up, we see a tremendous picture of God's judgment, but here we see a tremendous picture of God's love. One commentator went so far as to say that Zephaniah 3.17 is the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. It points to the cross. And we know 1 John 4, 7 and 8, John writes, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So we see this incredible picture of God's love presented in the pages of the Old Testament through the prophet Zephaniah. So let's look at the five specific promises that we have in Zephaniah 3.17. Promise number one, the Lord your God in your midst is the promise of divine companionship. The New Living Translation says, The Lord your God is living among you. New International Version reads, The Lord your God is with you. It's a personal promise. Your God is with you. Now, to Zephaniah, it would have been a national companionship, but us in the New Testament age, the church age, it is a personal companionship. We see... We see at the, at the end of the Great Commission, the final words of Christ in, in Matthew's Gospel, 20, verse 20, chapter 28, verse 20, Jesus says, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In 2 Corinthians 1, 22, God promises to deposit the Spirit in those who have trusted in Christ as a guarantee. But He also says that He sealed you. If you've turned to Christ in repentance and faith, you have been sealed by God, and He has deposited His Spirit in you. Divine companionship. That is a promise worth relying on. 
That is a promise worth relying on. Promise number two. So the first promise, divine companionship. Promise number two, the mighty one will save. The promise of divine deliverance. Word search through the Old Testament, you see the, the word mighty one used 11 times in the Old Testament, referring to the mighty one of Jacob or the mighty one of Israel. It gives this picture of a divine warrior, a divine hero. Let me point out to a few words here. So the mighty one. Not a mighty one. The Mighty One. Capital M, capital O. The Mighty One. Here's the next great word. Will save. The Mighty One will save. It is God who saves. He is God. He can save. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Deliverance, divine deliverance is a gift of God. He will save those who turn to Him in repentance and faith. Period. And that is a promise you can stand on. Divine deliverance. Now there are things in this life that we may never see the end of until we get called to glory. We will suffer. We will be persecuted. Health problems, relational problems, family problems, financial challenges. There are a lot of problems, and Christians are not immune from that. But one day, if you have trusted in Christ as your Savior and your Lord, you will be delivered from everything. Whether in this life or the next, you will be called home to live forever with Him. And that is divine deliverance. The Mighty One will save. Divine deliverance. About six and a half years ago, I became a dad. And my wife and I have been blessed with three beautiful, beautiful children. Four-year-old daughter, Alexa, six-year-old, six-and-a-half-year-old daughter, Grace, and her son, who's about one and a half, uh, Paul Jr., Dylan. Hey, four or five weeks ago, the girl said, Daddy, take us fishing. Daddy, we want to take, we want you to take us fishing. So I did what every dad does. The girls want, they want to go fishing. So we got our Barbie fishing poles, pink, you know, they're, they're Barbie, real pretty. We got our Barbie pink fishing poles, and we went down the Manatee River, north bank of the Manatee River, to a boat dock, and we went fishing. I had Alexa, my four-year-old, on my left, and she was casting her line into the wide end of the river. Grace, my six-and-a-half-year-old, she was casting her line back towards the bank, and I was fishing right in the middle, and I was making sure to watch out for them. And I heard two of the most terrifying sounds a dad can ever hear when he takes his girls fishing. I heard a splash, and I heard the shriek of my six-and-a-half-year-old daughter as she said, Alexa! My four-year-old little girl had fallen into the Manatee River, and I'm guessing it was about 12 or 18 feet deep at that point, guessing about how, how my line went out. She can swim, but not real good. She's never swam in any situation where there's been any kind of current. Uh, and I panicked. And I didn't jump in after her, and I learned after the fact that's a good thing, because that would have just pulled her down even farther. If big old me jumped in, the force of my body going in would have pulled her down even farther. But there was nothing that I wasn't going to do to deliver her from that. So I got down on my belly, and I reached out for her, and I see these big brown eyes coming up with terror, looking up at me, coming That says she raised up to the river, and she couldn't think enough to give me her arm. But I'll tell you, there wasn't anything I wouldn't have done to pull her out of the river. So I reached out, I did what any dad would have done, I reached out and I grabbed her like he grabbed, I grabbed her ponytail. <laughs> And I pulled her back to me. I pulled her back to me where I could get both of my arms on her. I grabbed her by the ponytail and I pulled her back. And that hurt. She was terrified. And she experienced physical pain when her dad delivered her. But I'll tell you what. I'd have sunk to the bottom of the Manatee River to save that little girl. There is nothing that I would not have done to save that little girl. 
And you know what? Jesus died to save you and to save me. There is nothing that God didn't do to offer us salvation. The divine deliverance. There are things in this world that we may never be delivered from. Let me just be clear. The life of a Christian is not one of material comfort. That may come, that may go. It is not one of health. That may come, that may go. But your divine deliverance, if you turn to Jesus in repentance and faith, your divine deliverance is guaranteed one day you will be brought home. It is God who saves. Promise number three. So we have divine companionship, divine deliverance. He will rejoice over you with gladness. Promise I've called divine delight. God will rejoice over you with gladness. We see throughout the pages of the Psalms over 50 times, talks about rejoicing in God, rejoicing in your salvation. But here it's God that rejoices in makes you smile. God rejoices in you. The same God who by His very Word created all things rejoices in you. It's in the book. God delights in you. And it's a true and a permanent delight that He has in His people. There is nothing that can be changed. It does not change or vary based on emotion. It does not change or vary based on circumstance. It is true and permanent delight. God Delights in you. We see in Romans 15, Paul writes about the God of all comfort. And that's the next promise that we have. It's the promise of divine comfort. He will quiet you with his love. The New Living Translation reads, With His love, He will calm all your fears. The English Standard Version says He will quiet you by His love. He will quiet you with His love. Being quiet, quieted by God's love is a peace that is indescribable. God the Creator, God the Ruler over all, nothing outside of His power or authority will calm you, will calm your fears by His love. Because we know that trial will happen. We know that troubles will happen. But we also know that God, by His love, will comfort us in the time of tribulation. Jesus, in John 16, 33, Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the word world, you will have tribulation. You will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen to that. Praise God that he has overcome the world. Notice he says, you will have tribulation. Anyone says that you won't is lying to you. The words of Jesus says, in this world, you will have tribulation. But Jesus has overcome the world. Jesus has, has overcome the world. When the fears of life, when the fears of financial challenges, losing a job, losing a spouse, losing a child, relational challenges, family issues, the God of the universe who created everything, Final promise we have here. Fifth and final promise. He will rejoice over you with sin. As great as our musicians are, and they are great, our orchestra, our praise band, our singers, all of our musicians are exceptional. None of that pales, in, all of that pales in comparison to the melody of God. The promise of divine melody. He will rejoice over you with singing. Now, everyone that's ever held, anyone that's ever held a crying baby knows what it's like to rejoice over someone with singing. 
What do you do when you have a crying baby? You pick him up, you put him in your arms, you walk, you shake, and you start singing. Doesn't matter if you can sing well, doesn't matter if you can't sing. Doesn't matter. That's what you do. Whether you're a parent, a grandparent, a nursery worker, you rejoice over that crying baby and you sing it. Unfortunately, most of us don't ever remember what it was like to be a six-month-old to have someone rejoicing over us and singing. And what that produces in your soul. But let me tell you about a story. When I was 17 years old, I had some pretty serious surgery. Went great. Summer before my senior year in high school. Went up to the hospital, had some, some major surgery done. Came home, started to recover. About 10 days after I got home. Something happened. I mean, 911, something happened. Taken to the hospital in an ambulance, something happened. Strapped into the bed, middle of the night kind of thing, something happened. And not a single doctor that saw me in the hospital down in Naples could say to mom, Mrs. Helton, this is what's wrong with your son. Not a single doctor that saw me down in Naples could say to my dad, Mr. Helton, this is what's wrong with your son. And by God's grace, I don't remember much of that at all. You know, I had test upon test, MRIs, spinal taps, you name it, they tested it for And by God's grace, I don't remember much of that at all. But one thing I do, as I do remember, as a 17-year-old young man, in the hospital when no one could tell me what was wrong with me, the melody of a mother rejoicing over her son. Every night, my dear mother sang me to sleep. And she rejoiced over me. She loved me so much. She rejoiced over me with singing. And the peace that comes from that pales in comparison to the peace of God. God, the creator of everything, rejoices over you with singing. And what a beautiful song. What a beautiful, beautiful song. So we see five tremendous promises in Zephaniah 3, 17. The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Let me leave you with three points on promises. As we close today. Three points. Point number one. A promise is only as good as its maker's ability and authority to keep it. A promise is only as good as its maker's ability and authority to keep it. I can promise and promise and promise, but if I have no authority and no ability to keep those promises... But here, these five promises are for, from God and they are on His authority. Two passages of Scripture that establish God's authority. In the beginning, God. Genesis 1, 1, A. In the beginning, God. Not in the beginning, Paul. Not in the beginning, any of you. In the beginning, God. And number two comes from the great commission. Often when we recite the Great Commission, we, we get to going in the making disciples part and the baptizing part really well. But let's read the authority on which we've been commissioned. Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So two passages of Scripture that establish the authority through which God can make these promises. Number one, in the beginning, God. Number two, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. That's why we have the miracles of the Gospels. Every single miracle found in the pages of Scripture in the Gospels establishes Jesus' authority. There is nothing that is outside His authority. Absolutely nothing. Every single miracle establishes Jesus' authority. All authority on heaven and on earth was given to him. We can rely on God's promises 
because he alone has the authority and the ability to keep them. Number two, a promise must be acted upon by its recipients. A promise must be acted upon by its recipients. And that's where faith comes in. Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. It's one thing to hear a promise, but it's another thing to act upon that promise. To take the promise of God and to put action behind it. That's where faith comes in. We act in faith. We act in faith. And we stand on the promise of the Word. The final point. Promises are given for a specific purpose. God's purpose for you and for me is not to make us wealthy, materialistically comfortable. Is not. Not to make us healthy. God's purpose for you and me is to make His glory known to the ends of the earth. And Christian, you have been given a privilege. If you have turned to Jesus in repentance and faith, you have been given the divine privilege of being allowed to be used by God to make His glory known to the ends of the earth. Philippians 2, 8, 9, and 10 reads, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, he being Jesus, humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross, Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. To the glory of God the Father. That is the purpose for which you were saved, to be afforded the privilege to be used by God to bring his glory to the ends of the earth. Period. And it's going to happen. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that He is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Period. We were not saved. We were, he did not die for us to come into this beautiful, beautiful building in the greatest nation in all the world in one of the greatest cities in this great nation Come into here one hour a week and leave unchanged. To live the other 167 hours of the week as if Jesus doesn't matter. He has saved us to deny ourselves, take up our cross daily and follow him. Even if that means going to the ends of the earth or if that means going next door. That is the divine privilege that you and I have as believers in Jesus Christ. If you have trusted in Him in repentance and faith, you have the privilege of being used by God to make His glory known to the ends of the earth, even if that costs you your life. Because there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Not death, not anything in all creation, no power, no spirit, no nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. That's how we can go and tell. That's how we can offer our lives to make His glory known. Because there is nothing that can separate a believer in Jesus Christ from the love of God. Absolutely nothing. He affords us the opportunity it might be scary. It might be like my four-year-old daughter falling off the dock into the bottom of the Manatee River and with a look of terror in her eyes. It might be scary. But God has promised you His companionship. And God has promised you and me as believers in Jesus Christ to never leave us and to comfort us and to delight in us and to sing over us. So I'm going to ask you, have you ever acted 
on God's promise? Have you ever acted on God's promise? I'm asking every person in this room. I said in the opening that many use Zephaniah 3.17 as the John 3.16 the Old Testament because it points to the cross. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.17 For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Have you acted? Or by your own action are you acting? Have you laid a claim to the promise of John 3, 16, 17, and 18? A promise that calls you to repentance and humble submission. Even if that means going to the ends of the earth or going to the neighbor next door. Have he who believes in the name of Jesus will be saved. So we act on that. We say, God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I've messed up. And I know I'm not worthy of your love. But I know Jesus came. He lived the life I couldn't live. He died the death I deserved to die. But on the third day was raised. God, I believe that's you this morning. If you've never believed in Jesus, I want to invite you to do that. Our musicians are going to come up and sing a song of invitation called Living for Jesus. Living for Jesus in no other way. There's absolutely no other way. If that's you this morning and you'd like to start living for Jesus, I'm going to be right down here in the front. I'd advise you just to stand up right where you are and come down and talk to me. If there's something else you'd like to come down and do, Pastor Mark's going to be here on the front pew as well. Come down and talk to us. Fill out a connection card. Let us know what you felt convicted of today. Father God, I thank you for the time that we've spent in the Word. I thank you for the time that we've worshipped. God, and I thank you that we can rely fully on your promises. God, as we close this morning, I pray that if there's anyone here that has never acted upon the promise, has never turned to you in repentance and belief, that you would convict them of the truth of the gospel and that they would come down and turn to you today and start living for you. There's no other way. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Would you stand as we sing? Living for Jesus a life that is true striving to please Him in all that I do yielding allegiance
you've ever been doing? Paul, how many sermons have you done in your life? Less than 10. Wow. Not bad? <laughs> Again, if you're a guest, we just want to say thanks for coming. We just want to encourage you maybe to come back and check us out. Also, next Sunday is another special day. It's our 9 o'clock breakfast. All right? You need to be here. It's, it's not just the donut. Okay? This is like major stuff. Be here at 9. Family Life Center. Okay? 9 o'clock. And then at 9.45, the Ditchfield Family Singers will be in concert right here. That's at 9.45. And then the service will start at 10.30. Okay? Everybody got that? 9 o'clock breakfast. 9.45 here. 10.30 here. Okay? And the kids, K-5, are going to have a movie over there for them. Just K-5. All right? Is that good? At 9.45 to 10.30. All right? Everybody square? Got it. Beautiful. Also, if you're a young family, we have our third installment of the uh, Beach Fam, uh, Fam Fest. And we're doing a Beach Fam Fest on Sunday, August 12th. Just want to say, mark your calendars for that. Paul will be back to greet you. Um, I'll be back there as well. Why don't we just bow right now and uh, pray and ask the Lord to uh, bless the rest of this day. Father God, we want to thank you for today. Father, we want to thank you um, for your love. God, I pray today that we wouldn't just be hearers of your word, God, that we would be doers. I thank you today that we can come and we can, and we can serve you, Lord. For it's in Christ's name. All right. I think I forgot the offering. <laughs> How did we forget that? Charlie. Well, at least that, uh, that got your attention and, and it reminded you to, uh, to get in your wallets. Uh, Paul, thanks for the message this morning. You did, a, you did an excellent job on it. And, uh, you know, the only promise I know is that, that if I do what God has told me to do, I'm going to be in heaven with Him. And, and, and I think that that's a simplistic uh, a promise that we all need to, uh, to understand and to keep. And uh, let's, let us go to prayer. This time of caring, let us pray for those that, that, as we give our tithes and offerings, to help those around us and those that are less fortunate than us. By giving the gifts, we will do as Jesus has directed and as the Old Testament leaders encourage their people to do. Give joyfully that which is the Lord's. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is what it looked like, okay? I want, you, I, want you to, I want you to look at this. Okay, here we were. I'm walking this way. There's like six guys coming right at me. <laughs> that was amazing. All right, why don't you stand again, all right? Let's try this one more time. All right, Father God, thank you again that we can come and we can worship you.
that we can uh, that we can serve you. We can learn more about you, God. And I thank you for Paul. And I thank you, Father, for his gift. I thank you, Father, for the way he's able to uh, take your word and, and to speak to our heart today. Father, again, we ask that you wouldn't just be that we wouldn't be hearers of your word, God, but that we would be doers. Thank you, Father, for your love. For it's in Christ's name. Amen.
you in case I call you, okay? Okay? Yes, sir. How are you? Good. Ken Petrie. Mark Gibbons. Hey, Mark. Hi, Mark. I'm Good. Mark Gibbons. Good to meet you. And, and Danny's <laughs> mother. Is who? Danny. Danny's mother. Dan Bates. Oh, you're, yes, I know you. I know you. <laughs> you know what? I've hardly ever come, I don't come to the service very often, so I don't get in here very often. Well, yeah. you should come more often. I know. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Yeah, I know where you sit too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fifty six years. I know. 
I don't know that we've ever talked. Have we ever talked? No. I don't think we ever have. No. It's about time. Hi. How are you, sweetie? Thank you. Good to see you. I didn't get my hug today, though, so I have to get my hug. I'm good, darling. That's my grandson. That's Jacob. He's from California. Oh, good. a long way, didn't you? Are you a surfer? I love those boots. I think I do. Let's go see. It's good seeing you. And I'm, I'm glad I got to talk to you finally. I've only been here 13 years. <laughs> 56. 58. You started over there in that, in that building. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 1961, right here. Yeah, I think that's what it was. And this is my daughter. How are you? Nice Martin, to meet you. Your dance sister. Sister. Oh, good to meet yeah. you. Yeah, I was just um, talking with uh, Paul's mother, who I used to teach with in Golden Gate in Naples. Oh, Golden Gate Elementary. Wow, she was my sister principal. World. She wasn't that's a small world. Yes, and so I got to say hello to her. Very I hadn't good. seen her. I've been retired 10 years, but um, I had a chat with her. Awesome. Very good. Oh, keep working at it. Yeah. See you later. Okay, bye bye. And he's going to meet us back here. Okay. Well, that's wonderful. Where's your church? Well, I, I have been. Hi there, I'm Terry. This I have been at First Baptist Church of Ocala. Uh, really? I was there as minister of music for over 10 years. You know, that was back just before the fire occurred. Yeah. Here's my pastor. Yeah. Just, just before the fire occurred, like two weeks before the fire. And then I was 10 years forward from that, moving yeah. into the new worship center. Yeah. And then I left there in the end of 01, 2001, yeah. to work with the Florida Baptist Convention. And I've been with the Florida Baptist Convention now for over 10 years. And we live in Ocala. We still live in Ocala. Uh, we live out off of uh, Fort King and near near Baseline. It's a uh, Orono subdivision out that way. We live on that side of town. Yeah, southeast. But that's where we live. Yeah. And lived there for 20 years. Maybe we'll run into you again in town. Absolutely. Yeah. Did, did, you do work, did you do work there in town? Oh, uh, no. We moved. When I retired, we, we moved from Naples here. I mean, to Ocala. To Ocala. Yeah. I believe I'd have done the reverse. <laughs> as, much as, as much as I love Ocala, I love you. We moved north. Well, God bless you. Everybody likes Ocala. Everybody likes Ocala. Everybody likes Ocala. Okay, do we know where Children's Church is? Alexa, sir, do you know where the children would be from Children's Church? Oh, they know. We've got one more time. Alexis. 